Rub up your engines! And Max says, I wish everybody listened to you. My friend bought a used Audi A4 two weeks ago, and today it's built the entire engine out. Any remedies? You know, there's always cliffs you can push those things off of, <laughs> unless you happen to live in the Midwest, where it's so flat and there's no cliffs or anything. <laughs> Most places you can find a cliff, you can push that thing off. That's why I warn people not to buy Audis. They're endless money pits as they age. They just are. They're high technology, and as they age, when they break, the high technologies really expensive to fix. A friend of mine works on them all the time. I said, what are you doing to that Audi with the big V12 engine in it? He said, well, it's got a bad fuel injector we have to change. I said, well, how long does that take? He said, all oh, the labor for it is about 20 hours, so we're charging them about $2,800 labor to change a fuel injector. That will tell you, you don't really want to buy one of those cars. <laughs> and they do ride nice and they're fast and all that, but when, when they break, and break they do, whoo, your money just flies away. 202 Ray says, 2000 and 2006 Nissan generation, any good? Does it have real Nissan reliability or Renault reliability? All right, Renault uh, took over Nissan and the quality went downhill, but that's right when they took it over and they hadn't ruined things as bad as they did later on. <laughs> They are more reliable. I had customers with the early 2000 Nissan Sentras, Maximos, and they loved them. They drove the crap out of them, and they still held up. They were still okay then. Closer to 2000, of course, the better, because the closer you get to 2010 and above, then they started making more garbage mobiles. So yeah, if you can find a lower mileage one, the older ones can be good. If you say thinking about fixing up an old one, yeah, definitely do the old one versus the new one. H.E. Pennypacker says, Scotty, I have a 2010 Nissan Altima 2.5 SL with the CVT. 118,000 miles. The RPM springs from 1,100 to 2,500 when I go downhill. Same thing happens in cruises on or off. Is this normal or is the old jet on its last legs? Yeah, those are weak transmissions. Obviously, it's starting to go out. But if it only does it when you're going downhill, you got 118,000 miles that's 10 years old. If you sell it, you're going to get practically nothing for that vehicle. You might try selling to see what you can get for it. Who knows? Maybe some crazy person will give you some serious money for it. If they do, sell it right away. I just say, the heck with it. And I drive it as long as it was still drivable. You never know how long it's going to last. Then, if it did go off, I just junk the thing. Sell it to somebody who likes fixing them. Not worth putting a CVT transmission in that thing. And the vehicle's worth not all that much money. It just starting to go on for only does it going downhill who knows maybe it'll still run for a few years you never know you got 118,000 miles out of the thing hopefully you didn't just buy it used if you did then you really got screwed over but if you bought it new eh, you got some miles out and I just said keep driving as long as you can drive it then if it goes out eh, and just get rid of the thing if you can't get anything for it used well it turns out that BMW's i8 car which technologically was a fascinating machine is no longer going to be produced they were a strange engine they were a turbocharged engine it drove the rear wheels, but it also had an electric motor for the back, electric motor for the front wheels too. A bizarre sports version of the Prius. <laughs> now they said it could go 18 miles on just electricity, you know, of course that's what they say. You can imagine in real life it probably didn't even go that far. But it could also go zero to 60 in a little over four seconds. It was a very fast little car. It's been around for six years. Obviously it was some type of a failure. Not going to be making them anymore. To me, a lot of this hybrid technology is kind of like stopgap. They really don't know what they're doing. They're trying this. They're going for that. And at the price that you pay, what you get back really doesn't equalize anything. You're not going to get your money back for the little bit of gas that you save because of the better gas mileage and the technology that's in them. I mean, regular BMWs are hard enough to fix. You can imagine a hybrid BMW is just total insanity. And I got to say, they were sharp looking cars, mid-engine, three-cylinder. They're not going to be making the i8 anymore. So if you want to have a really oddball car that they're not going to make anymore. You might go buy one if you've got a lot of money lying around it. You just don't mind throwing into a rather interesting technological car that in the end result failed. M. Julia says, Scotty, my dad sometimes borrows my 2010 Scion XB with a four-speed automatic transmission. Our parking garage has a four-degree inclination. He just lets it sit there and park. He doesn't pull on the emergency brake like I do. Is this going to destroy my transmission? A four-degree incline? Not really. Now, let's say you move to San Francisco where those big hills are. Yeah, you definitely there would want to do what you were doing. You'd want to put the car in neutral, then pull on the brake, then put it in park and turn it off. That is the best way to do it. Most people are too lazy to do that. They'll just pull it up, and park it, and put the emergency brake on. They don't care. Not that much of an incline. Four degrees isn't that bad. You're doing it best. 
because hey you never know what you strain on those are what's called the parking pro there's a little pro and when you put it in park that grabs the teeth and flywheel keeps you from spinning and eventually if it's too much it's just little prongs you could snap off and then they don't have any park when you put it in park they just roll so your put in a neutral pull on a brake or put it in park and turn it off is the best way to do it but what he's doing really isn't gonna hurt it g67 says hey scotty i got a 95 gmc suburban 1500 with 253,000 runs like a champ till the engine bay gets wet or humid then it runs crappy got an electrical problem right from my experience with gms and that thing's what 25 years old with 253,000 miles they are notorious for having ground fault problems is get a wiring diagram find all the grounds under the hood clean them shine your metal put them back on check all the wiring connectors pull them apart see if there's green corrosion if there is clean it with electrical spray cleaner snap them back together start with the ground system because they are notorious for having ground problems on gm systems as they age and if a ground goes bad when it gets humid then it just won't connect electricity correctly it's barely doing it when it's not wet now when it gets wet that messes the whole thing up so check all the grounds where they bolt on to the frame of the engine pray you can find something like that sooner than later jeff kelly says i got a 2012 jeep grand cherokee i use rainex additive to my washer fluid it coated my fluid sensor saying i'm out of washer fluid any way to clean the sensor or turn off the light boy that's an interesting one i've never seen that happen myself you're full and it says you're out of washer stuff uh cleaning it I, it's probably broken it or shorted it out what you can do if you want and you don't want to buy a new sensor you can just unplug the connector to the sensor and the light stays off great you got your light off you don't have to worry about it now if you unplugged it and it stayed on then what you do is since you unplugged it and it stayed on you can just cut the wires and then splice the two wires together and then it will think that it's full some of them when you unplug them the light goes off some of them you got to cut the wire and splice them together and then the computer is fooled thinking that because that's the full thing with them spliced together but first unplug it if it goes off great if it doesn't then splice the wires together and it'll go off you don't have to buy anything yeah those things are so annoying they don't break anyways i never heard of one break and put in the rain next and it might be a coincidence i don't know because i've never seen it myself fluffy shark says hello my friend's battery dies every two to six hours battery and alternator good and the test didn't show any drain two to six hours isn't that long so you're driving it stop it go somewhere and then when you try to start it it won't start that means you got a short when the car's turned off those are easier to find in that case watch my video how to find electrical drains in your battery try all that with a meter if there's any drains it's got to show off it's only logic now the problem is you can have something that comes on goes off and then you have to test it over the course of days it can be a real pain in the rear end if you have what's called a live short which means it's shorting while you're driving a vehicle so if if he's driving his car around all of a sudden it just stops while he's driving it live shorts can be hellacious to figure out what's wrong with them <laughs> because they only happen when a car's running when a car's running it's very hard to check a lot of electrical problems because everything's running so it's not easy to see okay everything's shut off but this one thing's draining like when it's shut off you know there's the problem but everything's running so everything shows power it's much harder to find a problem that is a live short that's where mechanics make big money if they can figure that kind of stuff out if he does what he could just try himself would be start on plugging stuff he doesn't need to begin with take the fuse out for the radio or for fog lamps or whatever and pray that it stops doing it then he knows that system is the problem but there's so many fuses and so many things can be if it's a live short Ooh, those are fun to i hate them when i get them in because i can't even tell the customers what's going to cost i just say what do you want me to do if you want to pay me a couple of hours okay here you owe me this amount of money for two hours of labor let me see what i can find because you never know with a live short they're very hard to find be wide one two three seven Scotty got a 2010 Grand Caravan, 150,000 miles, and I turned the steering wheel here a clunk, but the steering wheel doesn't have play. What could it be? Generally, from my experience of those, it's often the lower ball joints on the front. What you want to do is jack the vehicle up in the air and see if there's worn parts on it. And the ball joints, especially if you grab the tire at 12 and 6 o'clock and pull on it, you get some play and it'll be the ball joint moving on the bottom a little bit. But you want to check all the suspension parts. It does have 150,000 miles. you got a worn suspension part somewhere. You're just going to have to try to figure it out by jacking it up and pulling on stuff. Now, if you do that and you can't find any play, take it to a good front-end mechanic because they know how to load test them. A lot of times, they'll only make the noise when the load of the vehicle is on it, so they road test them and then they have machines that they 
used that put tension on particular parts. You might not be able to figure out yourself, but try to figure out yourself first because it's always easier if you see, aha, the ball joint's gone. And if you don't fix it yourself, you just say, I want this ball joint replaced. You'll get a price and then it's fair and they don't try to sell you a bunch of other stuff. Hey, Scotty in the community. A little fun question. Which car brands are driven by the most aggressive people? <laughs> well, that's a good one. Expensive cars generally. The most exotic ones are generally the most aggressive. People have Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and of course Porsches. If you're talking about pure aggression, the absolute most aggressive drivers are the young kids. If they bought themselves, say, a Dodge or a souped up Mustang or a souped up Camaro, generally it's the exotic cars, you know, a Lamborghini, Ferrari, and then Porsche, which isn't quite as exotic, but the people who buy them have a tendency of being obnoxious drivers, not using their turn signals, stuff like that. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.